Amen. Uh, Please open your Bibles with me to the book of James. And today we're moving into chapter 3, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Uh, Tim, our new director of youth and young adults, the last couple of weeks, Tim read for us at the beginning of the service from Psalm 64, uh, where David writes that it seems his enemies were wetting their tongues like swords. Wetting. Wetting a sword. That, that word W-H-E-T, to wet, means to sharpen. To sharpen the blade so it's ready to cut and slice. And uh, David's enemies were preparing their words and then speaking those words in an effort uh, to cut him down. It's so helpful to remember David's defense in that situation when, the, when his enemies were wetting their tongues against him like a sword. David's defense in this situation wasn't to have his own sword more wetted, more sharpened than his foes. David's safety was found in taking refuge in the Lord. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let the upright in heart exalt. Praise God. Not exalting in in having a comeback line, but exalting in the Lord of hosts, the God who never knows defeat because he is on our side and will win every battle. Our, Our natural inclination, though, so very often, is to have our own words ready. Uh, like uh, if you're at uh, winter time, it's, get, it's hot, right? Let's get winter time. Uh, like making a big pile of snowballs in a snowball fight, being ready to go, or, or reloading a, a paintball gun to have all of your paintballs ready to fire. We're loaded and ready to strike, ready for a, a quick retaliation when our foes lob their attack. And we might think, well, they had it coming. They had it coming. Serves them right. Our bent is to have a sword thrust ready. As soon as we see our opponent make their move. Uh, Maybe you've been watching the Olympics recently. One of the events I got to see a few clips of is fencing, or specifically foil. I didn't know it was called foil. I forgot that, but every four years you get a reminder, right? But that's the event where the two sword I'm going to butcher this, by the way, but the two swordsmen, they're facing each other on that narrow track, and they sword fight, okay? They, They try to be the first to connect, and that's about all I know about it right there. Uh, And to be honest, it's kind of hard to tell who scored or who won when you're watching it. They both jump at each other. They both lunge. They typically both make contact. And then one of them starts jumping around and celebrating. And the other one looks like, are you sure? And and eventually, they jump and celebrate again twice later because the judge says, yes, in fact, you were the first, right? But the idea is whoever hits first wins, okay? Now, if those were real swords which they're not, but if they were real swords, I think they would both be losing. They would both have holes in their chests, right? And when people have wetted their tongues like swords, I think the same thing is true. It's often hard to tell who's winning. And in fact, because those words are real and the intentions behind them are real, likely both have lost. But we're in the midst of a world and in a season with technology and social media and election year, and all kinds of other stuff going on. We're in a time where it doesn't really surprise us at all when people are using their tongues like arrows and swords. Going for the kill. Uh, Not thinking twice about it, frankly. But as the word of God is going to teach us this morning, for the Christian, these things ought not to be so. We are to bridle our tongues. And that doesn't mean that we never speak anything that's wrong or out of place, that we'd never say anything about things that are off. But when we do use our tongues, we use them, whether we're saying something is right or wrong, whether we're saying something is good or bad, we use our tongues to accomplish good, to speak the truth, uh, specifically to speak the truth in love, as it says in Ephesians 4, to build up. Uh, just remember a little context. If we, if we go back to the end of James 1, you might be able to see that just by, by turning one page. But in James 1, verses 26 and 27, James defines a pure and undefiled religion, what he calls an, a pure and undefiled religion. And he men- mentions three characteristics in these verses. It says this in verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue... 
but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's not doing anything. And verse 27 says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. From those verses, we find a bit of an outline for the rest of the book. Uh, Not necessarily in order, but these are the topics James covers in the rest of this letter. And, And there were three main ideas. One there was bridling the tongue, controlling our tongue. Uh, And then, second, visiting orphans and widows. Uh, More broadly said, doing good and caring for those who can't care for themselves and who can't care for you back. Selfless, sacrificial service. And then third, that idea of keeping oneself unstained from the world, or put in the positive, to pursue personal holiness, to pursue righteous living. Those three things are mentioned. And now, uh, we just finished chapter two in the last three weeks or so, Chapter 2 focused on the idea of selfless service. Orphans and widows were not specifically mentioned, remember, in chapter 2, but James did speak of partiality, that we aren't to treat uh, the person who comes into the church house and who appears to be affluent, we're not to treat them better than we would treat someone who appears less affluent or impoverished. Selfless service. It's not about what I can get out of it. It's about pointing people to Jesus, pointing sinners to Jesus for the good of our fellow man, to love our neighbors ourself, and for the glory of God. And then the passage we looked at for the last two weeks, uh, the whole argument of being justified by works, or that our faith in Jesus is proven, that it would be proven true, proven sincere and real by our good deeds. That whole passage followed that command to show no partiality, selfless service. So do you see how that fits into the whole? James 2, 14 through 26 is a continuation of the encouragement to pursue selfless service. Good works prove out your faith, your pure and undefiled religion. So pursue selfless service. Pursue good works. And then in chapter 3, as you can probably tell by the introduction, James turns to the topic of the tongue. And that's where we are today, our speech, our words. So let's look at James 3, starting here in verse 1. James 3, 1 says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter or greater strictness. Okay? We who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Isn't it interesting that in a passage primarily about being wise with our words, James warns us not to be enticed into the role of being a teacher, and specifically for the wrong reasons. Uh, people who teach or preach, they do say a lot of words, don't they? <laughs> and one of my not-so-favorite verses from Proverbs, with this in mind, Proverbs ten nineteen says this, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. That encourages me to have good notes when I go into the pulpit. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. It's interesting, though, and sometimes there can be a pull to wanting to be the teacher. Uh, not for everybody. Some people would never want to be in front of a crowd. You're like, Pastor Andy, if you were willing to go up there and do that, you go for it. I don't want to touch that platform or be in front of all these people. And certainly never for the purpose of giving a public speech, right? Some of you remember you're having flashbacks to that school presentation in front of like 25 people in your classroom and you were petrified, right? So some people don't want to be a teacher ever. But for others... There can be a certain allure of being the teacher, the teacher. Being the one who it seems you might think or feel that people come to hear speak. It can be something people can get jealous over. Something that people dream about one day being able to do. Uh, Maybe some dream about getting a book published or becoming a conference speaker or anything like that. And we have to be careful about why we might wish for these kinds of opportunities. Jesus warned people in his earthly ministry about the more selfish bent toward the temptation to be the teacher in the room. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their own finger. 
They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Their phylacteries were the boxes that they literally wore on their foreheads to try to obey the principle of the law in the Old Testament of keeping the word of God before your eyes on your forehead. Which that just means reading the word of God. It doesn't mean put a box on your forehead, but they said, I can do that really well. And they put a box and they would, they would actually write down scriptures and put them in the box on their forehead. And the bigger your phylactery, the more impressive you were, the more spiritual you must be. Verse 6 in, in Matthew 23 says, They love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Why did these men want to be teachers? Because they loved to be called rabbi. They loved special greetings, special seats at the table, to be held in high regard, to be thought of by others as impressive. I think teaching, preaching is service. Service to God first and to the people, right? If, if, a, if a teacher wants to be called the rabbi, wants to be called, the, oh, you're just an amazing teacher. Oh, we're so, you're, you're so amazing. And oh, uh, the smiles and the eyes. and the, If that's what it's all about, if a preacher were to have that heart, then you all gather to serve the preacher. And the preacher is not preparing and, 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 and ministering to serve you and to serve the Lord. That's so very backwards. Do you see that? They loved to be called the rabbi. But you know, teaching is not all it's cracked up to be, all you might think it is. First of all, when you're the teacher, not everybody likes what you say. <laughs> you might be surprised by that. There will be people who appreciate, but there will be critics too. Uh, on both constructive criticism, which when humbly received, can be a really good thing. And, and then there's also some not so constructive criticism. But far more important than that, just what people think, far more important than the opinions of people, God is the judge. That's what James says here. God is the judge. And teachers of the word of God, we are teaching God's word, not our opinions. God's word. So this is not just like some fun activity. This is God's word. And the job of the teacher and the preacher is to accurately convey the message that the God of the universe, the Lord of hosts, wants his people to hear. And God is paying attention. It's said that when John Knox first stepped into the pulpit, he was overcome with the weight, the gravity of what he was about to do. And he got behind the pulpit and he started weeping. Weeping uncontrollably. And he had to be consoled by others in the church before he could get back up and try again. It wasn't a, uh, oh, this is fun. He wept. Uh, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when, when confronted with the glory of God, right before his commissioning to herald the message that God was going to give to his people, he said of himself, Woe is me, for I am lost, a man of unclean lips. He knew he wasn't worthy. God sanctified him and set him apart and cleansed him. None of us are worthy to communicate God's word. Teaching the Bible ought to be a very humbling task and only ever pursued with a right fear of God and, and love for his people. Uh, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Uh, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says, who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from my sin, Proverbs 20, verse 9. And by the way, nobody can say that. Second uh, Chronicles 6, 36, for there is no one who does not sin. First John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All of us sin. We all stumble in many ways, James said. Isn't that true? Amen that? This truth causes us, it requires us to turn to Jesus for rescue. And it gives us reason to pause to speak. To pause to think we ought to be the teacher or to have a desire to be seen as the expert in the room, no matter what room we're in. It ought to cause us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And it's interesting, in verse 2, James turns, he starts to turn to further illustrations and, and, and point in his exhortation concerning the tongue. Uh, the word perfect 
The word perfect in verse 2. It says that he is a perfect man who does not stumble in what he says. That word perfect means complete or fully mature. And none of us are that. Only Jesus accomplished that. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 22, it says this. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus is perfect, uh, but none of us have arrived. We've not arrived, and we won't arrive until Jesus arrives when he comes, when he comes again. And when we do arrive at perfection, when Jesus comes, we'll know more than ever that all the glory belongs to God, to the Lord for our perfection. But we are, by God's grace, we are in a process of sanctification and growth, right? So as we are being perfected, as we are growing in maturity, what would it make sense to see happening in the use of our tongues over time? Seeing in our mouths, our words. By God's grace, we'll stumble less and less. And if we're growing in controlling our tongues, then it would stand a reason that we would be growing and controlling the rest of ourselves too. It all goes together. That's what James is referring to. It looks, it looks too like James here is making a point about just how hard it is, how hard it can be to be in control of our tongues. Saying if you can get control of your tongue, if you can accomplish that, then the whole body is going to follow. Which makes us think, well, the tongue might be the hardest thing to get control over. And James gives a few illustrations. Look with me at verse 3. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Verse 4 says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. A horse is weighing over a thousand pounds can be controlled by a jockey who weighs just 110 pounds. Uh, in equestrian events, the rider can make that horse dance. Have you seen that before? R- jump in side to side, on angles, backwards, all that kind of stuff. Uh, make them jump over obstacles, all kinds of things. How do they do that? Well, they put a bit and bridle on that horse. The bit fits into their mouths, and, and with some training, or lots of training, the horse will do whatever you direct it to do, within reason. They won't, like, file your taxes or anything, but they can do pretty much whatever you teach them to do. And a ship. Uh, I looked up the size of a rudder on an aircraft carrier this week. And amazingly, the rudders on a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, those rudders are 29 feet high and 22 feet long. And they weigh 110,000 pounds. The rudder. Those things are huge. And you might be saying, well, Pastor Andy, you're kind of killing the point here. Those rudders are too big. But wait. The whole ship is 1,092 feet long and 252 feet wide. They weigh, the whole ship, over 104,000 tons. The rudder weighs 110,000 pounds. The ship, 104,000 tons. Now it seems like a small rudder again, doesn't it? And yet... Those small rudders guide the whole ship wherever the will of the pilot or the captain directs. So the tongue is a small member, a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. Uh, Before verse 5 ends, then a new illustration begins. From the horses to the ships, now to a wildfire. The rest of verse 5 says this, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Um, maybe you've heard of the Great Chicago Fire. That was back in 1871. As the story goes, that fire was started by a cow kicking over a lantern in a barn. The whole city, right? It's by such a small fire. How many times over the years have we heard reports of of, uh, wildfires, forest fires, usually out in California or maybe up in Canada? There's some growth of that right now, but always started by just a small campfire. Even last year, that last June, uh, we saw the smoke from wildfires in Canada stretching throughout the Midwest. Remember that last summer? Uh, Our family, we went out to Lake Michigan one day and stood out on the beach uh, in uh, Grand Haven, and we couldn't see the water from the beach because of the haze, the, the smog from the smoke. 
And a fire like that, fires like that can be started with just a single spark. As long as the air is right, as long as there's more stuff to burn nearby, that fire will never go out unless someone puts it out. Uh, Think the person who started that initial campfire. They have no control over the extent of the fire once it gets out beyond their ability. No control over the extent, no control of the consequences of that fire. So it is with the tongue, with the words that we communicate. Uh, we, see, we see the tongue, verse 6 here, it says, The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. We, we see the tongue being and doing three things in this verse. Three things. Uh, the word world, if we look at that. The word world is used in the Bible to talk about this big globe that we live on, but also the system of the way things are around us. Like when someone says, it's a crazy world out there. Uh, they're not talking about the complexity of soil and rock and water and the physical planet, Right? They're talking about people and relationships and government and all the things or the system within which we live. So when we use that system idea, when James says the tongue is a world of unrighteousness, it carries the idea of our words uh, or the words of the world being a system or a generator, an environment that produces all kinds of unrighteousness. In the wildfire illustration, think unrighteousness spreading like wildfire, sparked by, inflamed by the tongue, the things we communicate. And when that unrighteousness spreads, it damages or stains the rest of the body as it goes. There's the initial damage, and then it just keeps going from there. The tongue is a small member of the body, but when it sparks that fire, the whole rest of the body is negatively affected. And not just the body not just the self or the person who suffers for their own words, but also then it says the whole course of life. The whole course of life. We can, again, we can choose to sin, but we never get to choose the consequences. That's a tough reality for people often. We can choose to sin, but we don't get to choose the consequences. We often feel more burdened by the consequences than we do of our sin, right? Uh, This truth may be at its most poignant when we realize the consequences that can come from our words. Things that seem so easy to say, just that slipping out of our mouths so effortlessly with little to no thought that can change the course of life. And this power to affect change, this staining, this system that produces unrighteousness, it says it is set on fire by, what does the end of verse 6 say? set on fire by hell. Meaning, it's fulfilling hell's purposes. It's fulfilling Satan's purposes to corrupt, to destroy, to kill. Uh, The word translated as hell is the word Gehenna. It's from a place called the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. It's just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, Back in Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 19, we see that the Jews in Jerusalem, in their unfaithfulness to God, they had gotten involved in child sacrifice and human sacrifice to Molech, or it says in those passages, to the Baals, the gods of other peoples, the false gods of the nations around them. And and so this, this human sacrifice was taking place in this valley until reform, until the reform under King Josiah, uh, when there was repentance and a turning away from that horrific sin. And then the land in the valley after that was deemed unclean to use for anything uh, because of the atrocities that had taken place there. They didn't want to use it for anything else. And so what they did is they started using it as a dump. And they would burn their trash. They would burn uh, human waste. They would burn dead animals. They would even uh, burn the bodies of those who'd been uh, uh, executed. All kinds of things like that. And the fire would never go out. It was just a terrible place. And it became known 
over the years symbolically to refer to the place of divine punishment, to, to refer to hell. In Mark 9, Jesus talked about the prospect of being thrown into hell for those who reject God, uh, those who would be thrown into Gehenna. And he called it where the worm doesn't die. Think maggots. Where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, Hell. Prepared, the Bible says, prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. And it's fires fueling the fires of the tongue. We think of it often as the place that we don't want to go, that we wouldn't want people to go for eternity. And this passage is using it as something that fuels hateful, unrighteous, terrible speech. It's fires fueling the fires of the tongue, spreading out as a wildfire, burning everything in its path, seeking to destroy and kill even the entire course of life. It's a stark and a grotesque picture, isn't it? And James is not, he's not messing around here. This is very intense. Uh, He adds further illustration, verses 7 and 8. Verse 7 says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Uh, We can train dogs to sit. We can train our dogs to shake hands, to to roll over and play dead and all that kind of stuff, that fun stuff. Uh, Parakeets and parrots and cockatoos, they can be taught to ask for a cracker. I think their name is Polly, right? Cobras can rise up and dance around to the music of a flute. Uh, killer whales, dolphins at, at SeaWorld, they can jump through hoops and pass a ball around, all that kind of stuff. We can make all kinds of wildlife do all kinds of things. But the tongue, <laughs> our own mouths, James calls it a restless evil. And that word restless could be translated as uncontrollable. Think of like you're so, you're so restless, you cannot stay still in your seat. Uncontrollable. All these animals can be controlled. Our own tongues, uncontrollable. And, and that dancing cobra, they, they can stay in that basket and keep their mouth shut. But with the tongue, this, pa- this passage says the venom flows. So David wrote in Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Lord, be gracious to me and set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips, he said. Uh, James then moves to the idea of duplicity, hypocrisy, and the purpose of our speech. Verse 9 says, With it, with our tongues, with our words, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And then here's where he says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. These things ought not to be so. Notice, uh, those whom we ought not to curse, they are those who are made in the likeness of God. Uh, Question, how many human beings fit into that category? Made in the image of God. What percent? A hundred, that's right. I was going to give you some help to say it's somewhere between a hundred and a hundred, but it's a hundred, okay? All people are made in the image of God. And a person might say, but did you hear what they said? (laughs) Did you hear who or what they support? From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. These things ought not to be so. Uh, You might be noticing and thinking uh, as we've been working through this passage and as you've been listening to the sermon, a lot of this is pretty bleak. Our tongues can be used for so much hurt and damage or for application, it'd be appropriate to make sure that we include other forms of communication, not just the spoken word, but also the written word. Letters, texts, social media posts, on and on that could go, different means of communication. But this whole passage has been, uh, watch out wanting to be the teacher. Everyone stumbles. The tongue boasts of great things. The tongue is destructive and set on fire by hell. The tongue can't be tamed. And it shouldn't bless and curse. Both kinds of words coming out of the same mouth, which is impossible to do with true sincerity. And then a 
these things ought not to be so statement. And I think we could all hear that, these things ought not to be so, and say, yeah, sure, I agree. It shouldn't. But what? Other than having a great horse and boat illustration and, and the wildfire idea and the taming of animals, which is fun to think about, these are all neat pictures, it's all very interesting, but what hope do we have? Can we change and grow? Are we just destined for destroying everything with our tongues? Is that the end of the sermon? Are we hopeless? I mean, cool illustrations, but is that it? Should we just cut our tongues out then? Okay, good news. That was the setup, right? Good news. I think verses 11 and 12 start to point us in the direction that we need to go for hope and growth. Uh, let's look at these final two verses, 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grape vine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. These verses complete the thoughts uh, from verses 9 and 10. So they go together with 9 and 10. A mouth that utters blessings and cursings shouldn't be able to function any more than we should expect to get a bottle of Dasani or, or Aquafina water, like an empty bottle, and, and go into the Dead Sea and pull it up, or the Atlantic Ocean and pull it up, and oh, perfectly clear and so fresh and good to drink, right? No, that's ridiculous. You can't expect that. What's in that body of water is what's going to come out. So an olive tree is going to bear olives, not olives and figs. And a fig tree is going to bear figs. The same idea, same uh, purpose for the illustration. Uh, this might remind you of another passage in the Gospels uh, from Jesus teaching on our words and our hearts. This is, uh, well, Luke 6, 43 through 45 and Matthew 12. So if you were to go home and look up Luke 6 and Matthew 12, you'll see both of these passages saying the same thing. I'm going to read to you from Luke 6. Jesus says, uh, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. And then this line, For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. What's inside is what comes out. Out of the abundance, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So church, how do we get control of our tongues? How does the content of what we say, what we write, what we type, what we put out through our mouths or through pens or through keyboards, how does the content we produce change in its nature and its intended purpose and goal, in its quality, in its righteousness? As James said, pure and undefiled. If we're going to see a change in what comes out of us, there first has to be a change concerning what is inside of us, in our hearts. And I can't just change my heart, right? Just the snap of my fingers. Uh, we can't just change our hearts, but who can? God can, and God does. This change comes first initially when we're saved, when, a, when God makes us new creations in Christ Jesus, redeemed through his sacrifice at the cross. And by God's grace, that change continues and we mature. We go through a maturing process called progressive sanctification in and through, how does that happen? In and through beholding Christ, looking at Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 teaches us this. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We behold the glory of the Lord and we are transformed. We see Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his selfless love and selfless service to us while we were yet sinners. And we know through that knowledge, through that observance, we know what it is to love someone who doesn't return the kindness or who doesn't yet appreciate what we're doing for them. 
we see the forgiveness that we've received from God through Christ, and we then have the fuel and the ability to forgive others. We see Christ's proactive love for us, and we understand uh, why Paul would say then, just for an example, in Ephesians, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Our model is to look at Jesus. We see Christ's willingness to wash the feet of his disciples before his crucifixion, and there we learn what it means to serve others in humility. And then again, 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll read 21 through 23 this time. It says, for, uh, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, they thrusted the sword first. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. These are all words, right? The lack thereof. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. God, his fortress. We know how to suffer injustice looking to Jesus. We know how to speak and how to refrain from speaking. We know how to use our tongue rightly by looking to Jesus. We love because he first loved us. We forgive because he first forgave us. We suffer well because he first suffered well. We humbly serve because he first humbly served us. We look to the mind of Christ, to the heart of Christ, that our hearts and minds would be formed, shaped into Christ's likeness. And with that grace and knowledge and growth and maturity and love, with all of that happening being stirred up in us, with that, we bridle our tongues. It's not just something you do because you exercised a whole lot. Lifted weights, you ran on the treadmill or whatever that would be with your tongue and then all of a sudden it starts working better. No, no, no. There is a transformation that takes place in the heart of a follower of Jesus that changes the use of our tongues. Do you see this? So look to Jesus. Say, how do I, how do I fit? I'm, I'm having a hard time with my words. First thing, look at Jesus. Behold the glory of your Lord. And God uses this to transform you, to change our hearts. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay? That fresh water would come out. A heart full of blessing, words full of blessing. So church, keep looking to Jesus. Be transformed from the inside out. And as our hearts are purified, we'll grow. And not just the tongue, but the whole body, right? We'll be speaking the truth in love, growing and building others up, growing and repairing and restoring relationships, growing and giving godly biblical instruction and training, using our words for the good of others, and of course, to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, you knew of all of our sin, not just the things we do and have done, but the things, uh, and this is a thing we do, but also the things we say, that we have said, uh, that are sinful. We thank you that Christ died for every sin, every evil word, every evil deed. And I pray, Lord, that uh, these truths would cause us to rejoice, to be gra grateful, thankful, uh, humble us, and that in our humbling, in our rejoicing, in our thanksgiving, in seeing who Jesus is and what he says, that we would follow our Lord we can't control our tongues, but in Christ, we can. So God, use us in this way. And, and may we use our tongues, our mouths, our words, our pens, our keyboards uh, to, to live in such a way that points people to your goodness, to your glory, and to our Savior. 
God be glorified through all of this. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.